I like to describe the three principles in kind of a simplistic way um, that makes sense to a lot of people because a lot of people in life sometimes come in and they say they have found themselves in the pit. <clears throat> and the pit, um, and, and then we have this other group of people that kind of talk about this experience of being kind of up in the helicopter. So when people are in the pit, what we would call that is we would call that insecure fatigue, or sometimes the busy mind. So when people are in the pit, they um, have lots of experiences that they've shared with me over the years. They might experience things like um, pressure or anxiety or um, sometimes people, when they're in the pit, they really find themselves struggling. Um, it's, very, it's very effortful for them. Uh, sometimes people, depending upon how long they've been in the pit, maybe they get depressed. Uh, or they, um, they feel sad or alone or a lot of times helpless. Depending upon how long they've been there, uh, they might think, well, why am I always here? How come this always happened to me? So we say that they maybe have a me focus, or in psychology we talk about ego, or maybe pride. And, and if they're focusing on me and how come this always happens, uh, a lot of times what happens is all of that changes into anger. They get very, very angry that they are in this peril. To these people, you would talk to them and they would say, well, you just don't understand, this is a very serious situation. To them, it's the be-all, end-all. Nobody else has ever felt this way. This is theirs, they own it, and it's intensely real to them. Uh, they focus a lot on the details. They have a lot of debris in their eyes. They have um, gravel and rocks. So we would say things like, uh, they, there's a saying, the devil's in the details. So they have a very detailed focus. Or at workplaces, I've heard of staff that talk about managers who micromanage them. So this is really a, a tough spot to be in. Um, I hope that kind of makes sense. There's a lot of other probably things, descriptors that people have used, um, but we'll go with those for right now. The alternative would be up here in the helicopter. Up here we would call this kind of free flow, right? Or maybe these people are secure, or kind of like in the zone. In sports, players talk about being in the zone. So up here, it's the complete opposite of what's down here. Maybe up here people are, um, instead of serious, maybe they're light-hearted. Or maybe this is, instead of being effortful, maybe this is effortless. Um, maybe this is us or humble. Um, maybe happy. Peace of mind. Instead of detailed focus, these types of people seem to have the ability to um, see the big picture. In business, this is where a lot of brainstorming happens. Uh, people have a lot of free thinking that they are experiencing. They're hopeful. And uh, they, they, um, they, just see, they just see the glass half full. These are the glass half full. This is the glass half empty people. I think that kind of summarizes the two different places that I can exist. So fundamental to our belief system here, what we believe is that we believe this is what people are born with. And we say that over time, this is what people learn. We call this innate health. It's inside of us all the time. 
What we say takes people away from this good feeling is we say that thought takes people away from this good feeling. Now, as a therapist, I was trained to work with people down here. Work with people down here. Do something with people down here. And offering people techniques or maybe coping skills. Uh, these people are always coping. There's, there's never an end to their coping. What they do is they cope. That style works for a while. And then they need to cope again. Uh, it, there's an endless there's an endless amount of coping. Coping is kind of reaching a ceiling or a plateau until you need to reach another plateau of coping. So being taught that I need to work with people down here. So what people say when they come into my office, they say, well, yes, I am a lot down here. What do I have to do to be more up here? Right? The challenge is, for me, I was doing a lot with my clients, but my clients weren't getting any better. They, they were maybe temporarily feeling relief, but they didn't have an understanding maybe as to why that relief happened. They, were, they felt relief because of the gimmick, because of the technique, because of whatever little um, magic I had in my, in my toolkit. And what I learned when I understand, started understanding the three principles is the more you do down here, the further away you get from this. That this is all about doing. You can't do anything to get what you already have. This is already there. It's just covered up by debris, right? So, <clears throat> for instance, if I have a, you know, I have a beaker of water, right? I'll do the same beaker here. Beaker of water, and this, this beaker is all stirred up with debris. Okay, well, what do we need to do to have the debris settle down and have the beaker be clear again? Leave it alone. Without any doing of any kind, it reverts back to its natural state. It's like a snow globe, right? The only way you can see that a snow globe is a snow globe is when you shake it up. That's doing something. And then when you leave it alone, it goes back to clear. So clearing up your mind is really your natural state, having a clear mind. The way it looks to me, we talk about is the thought cycle. So thought creates feelings. Feelings get action. And action gets results. Okay? So Every feeling I have is coming from a thought. You can't have a thought without having a feeling. Okay? Or I'm sorry, you can't have a feeling without having a thought. And the trick is, I will most often times experience my feeling before I will actually know my thought. So feelings are really a, a kind of a quality control. Feelings are a, a quality indicator of the thinking that I have that's going on inside my head. So feelings aren't coming from out there. They're coming from inside. And what we do as humans, well, what I do, is I start attributing my feelings to something outside of myself. It doesn't dawn on me that my thinking is even really relevant. Right? A lot of people don't even know that thinking is a requirement. Thinking is, not a lot of people have ever given any thought to their thinking. It's kind of crazy. Thinking is not an involuntary response like blinking. It's a requirement. So all you're doing is living in the experience of your thoughts. That's it. It's kind of cool. So the trick is when I'm feeling, so if I'm feeling angry, right? Feeling angry. I have a lot of angry thoughts, right? They're kind of sharp and intense. If I'm feeling anxious and worried, I have a lot of busy thoughts. If I'm feeling, um, well, if I'm feeling calm and happy, it's nothing. It's clear. Air is clear. So it's kind of cool. But taking your feelings and, and realizing it might not be true. When I'm feeling angry, the police understand this because the police tell you, right? When you're getting arrested, uh, they, they know you're in peril. And they tell you, hey, uh, anything you say or do will be used against you in a court of law. 
you have the right to remain silent. Why do they tell you that? Because they know you're not in such a great feeling spot. And if you go ahead and speak, chances are it's not going to go so well for you. How many people actually listen to what the police say? Very few. Those that have um, listened have probably already been arrested before and know that it doesn't go well for them. But really realizing that there's nothing good that comes from a bad feeling. I have tried many, many times to make decisions in a bad feeling state. It's never worked. So that, that instinct, that knee-jerk reaction of I've got to do something when I'm here is not the best idea. So waiting, waiting for this to settle down until this appears, this is always there, but it's, it's hidden from sight because of all of the debris. Right? So, and parents, parents teach kids this because what do we do? When parents, we see kids, we see our kids as feeling angry or frustrated, we warn them, hey, if you keep this up, right, it's not going to work out for you, and you're probably going to get a, a spanking, you're probably going to have to go to your room for a timeout. So I'm cautioning you, stop, and what? Go take a timeout. But as a, an, a, an, a, an adult, do I ever tell myself to take a timeout? Or do I just feel so inclined that when somebody cuts me off, I'm going to chase after them and I'm going to show them when maybe really I should have taken a timeout. It's hard because those feelings are meant to seem real. It's intense. You're causing your thinking to come to life when you add those feelings. It's like a science experiment. If you have, as a kid, I kind of did some interesting things and one of the experiments I had was baking soda and vinegar, right? Two compounds that really have no properties, not, they're, they're kind of benign. But what I would do is I would put vinegar in a Tupperware container and then I wrap up with a little piece of tissue, um, some baking soda, and then I put it in the vinegar, shut the lid and shake it up and then it would explode, right? It's a gas. So you have two elements that combined create a whole different experience. Your thinking combined with your feelings create an experience that you call life. You're the combiner, and if left alone, the experience doesn't happen. It's kind of cool. So <clears throat> a lot of times with clients, they say, well, I, I get this. I'm going to go home, and I'm going to work on it. OK. And they come back, and they say, well, I don't understand, because I've been trying to stop my bad thoughts. I, I, I'm going to do my best to stop my bad thing. Yeah, that doesn't work. Stopping your thinking happens usually when you're dead. You can't stop thought. Thought is always happening. Dreams are thoughts that you do nothing with. Okay? So it's recognizing the quality of your thinking and realizing that you have the opportunity to let them pass by, like clouds in the sky. Clouds are not part of the sky. They're abstract elements that pass through. So they come to us on, as the as the foreground, and the sky looks like the background. When in reality, the sky is always the sky. The clouds are just kind of occasionally there. If, if, if you didn't know better and the clouds came over, right, you might think that the sun burnt out, but the sun's always there. So when these bad feelings come, a lot of people panic, and they do a lot. When a person's in peril, they're going to be struggling and doing a lot. So in, in a relationship, I'll use myself. So if I'm in the pit, right, and my wife, Renee, is in the helicopter, remember, I'm going to be doing mean things, saying mean things, okay? I'm going to be doing a lot. Now, if she takes it personally or she tries to fix it, now she's in the same boat that I'm in. That's the saying, misery loves company, right? Right. So jumping in and trying to save somebody when they're in the pit is not a good idea. It's like jumping in and trying to save a drowning person. Their first instinct is what? To pull you down. So the better approach for Renee, if she really wants to help, and we talk about this for people in the helping profession. People in the helping profession are very depressed, um, medicated, divorced, and suicidal because they have the belief that they can fix this. So 
going back to Renee, if Renee recognizes that I'm in peril because I'm doing a lot, for her to keep her bearings and stay up here, she's going to realize that the reason why all of this is happening is because my thinking is off. And if my thinking is off, what is my default setting? Health. So if given time, I will revert back to well-being a lot quicker than if she comes down and tries to save me. So when my wife learned this, she started asking me, well, you, you just need to let me know how long you think you need to be this way. <laughs> well, it was terrible. Because now I had to realize, oh, I have a choice in the matter. I get to choose. Versus, no, she needs to do something to make me feel better. A person, place, or thing does not make me feel. It's how I think about that person, place, or thing. My thinking belongs to me, and it's causing me to see the world the way I see it. So it's a much better approach for her to stay keeping her bearings and keeping hope, keeping potential, keep seeing me in all of what it is she knows I'm capable of versus realizing and believing that she has to do something about it. Believing that she has to do something about it is just going to muddy the waters even more. I hope that makes sense. So if this is true, where do I live the most of my life? Well, I don't know. Maybe this is where we need to cut and, and edit because sure. um, I, I, I spend more of my time down here. I might not be the best person to be doing this uh, show because if I spend the majority of my time down here, right, then why am I talking about up here? How is it that I know this, but I still live down here a lot of the time? Well, because of my, my family of origin, um, the culture that I live in. Our culture is really bent on drama, trauma, and chaos. This fuels an economy. Watch the news. How much of the news is given to good stuff? What, the last five minutes? So if this fuels an economy, this is so much easier for me to gravitate towards and hold on to. And it's sad because this then gets relegated to just on occasion. Maybe if we go on vacation, I can experience this. Wow, that's pretty bad. But me knowing that these two places exist is so helpful. I want this in my life. I desire this. I know this is possible because I know that it's within me. So now what I understand is I understand um, this might get messy. Let's try to clean this up a little bit. This is kind of a continuum, right? So between these two spots, we have a lot of lines. Kind of like an elevator that has different floors, right? When I'm in the basement level and I get out, well, I just don't think there's any other levels because I can't see from underneath the basement, right? But if I realized that this is a 30-story building, the view from 30 stories up is much different than the basement. So knowing that I am always going to be fluctuating between these two spots, and we call this vertical line, we call this state of mind. Okay, So when my state of mind is problemed, everything starts looking poor. When my state of mind is healthier, everything looks possible. So my state of mind is always fluctuating. And it's kind of interesting that when my state of mind begins to become problematic, this picks up speed, right? Everything starts going faster. My anger, my frustration, my irritability just starts driving the show. And Everything starts looking like something. All the little stuff is now right on my eyeballs. So being able to realize that, man, when I start racing, when I start nitpicking, when I start getting angry and frustrated, my state of mind is becoming problematic. It's not necessarily true that everything around me is problematic. It's more true that it's my state of mind. So in a relationship, what is a problem? Well, problem is just what you think it is. And instead of it being a problem that's between me and Renee, maybe it's just an indicator of our state of mind. Right? 
And maybe if I see it as just a problem of our state of mind versus it's a statement about who we are as a couple. No, it's a statement about our state of mind, that argument is. When it becomes personal, that's another sign that I'm here. Okay? So if this is the vertical state of mind, this is the stuff of life. Okay? The stuff of life is the horizontal. So we talked in the past, we talked about, well, I've had cancer, and we have um, two children that passed away, and sometimes the business doesn't do so well. Sometimes I wish I didn't live in such a big house. Sometimes my kids don't do what they're supposed to do, right? So the stuff of life is always happening. But the stuff of life only looks the way it does because of where it is I'm looking at it from. From this vantage point, the stuff doesn't seem such a big deal. From this vantage point, holy moly, the stuff is dramatically huge. So it's much more helpful to me, instead of trying to change all the stuff, if all I did is recognize that my state of mind is always, it's, it's altitude, right? Altitude is attitude. <clears throat> so realizing, man, I have within me at all times this healthy state of mind that's ready to be accessed whenever. The trick is understanding that in the moment. It's always in the moment. And when I'm in peril, giving myself time to come back up here, because I always will. Does that make sense? So thinking, thoughts only live as long as you think of them. Kind of cool. As long as it's on my mind, it's, it's all I can see. And if I'm feeling a bad feeling, if all I do is pause, Wait, there's another feeling, there's another thought that's right behind it. It's like a buffet, right? I don't know if you've ever been to a buffet, but oh my goodness, there's no way I'm going to like everything that's at a buffet. But a buffet of thought, I get to choose which item do I want most. And there's probably some I want to pass on. That's kind of cool to realize that it's, 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 it's up to me. And whatever thought I think, it's going to be how it is I see the world. <clears throat> I hope that makes sense. The two different places that we exist and that I exist a lot down here. Family history, family of origin, my culture. Oh, this is where we fuel an economy too because we have lots and lots of anti-anxiety medications, antidepressant medications. We have... We have um, treatment programs, we have theories, we have counseling, we have a lot of stuff that fuels this and can support this. It's sad that this doesn't get so much press or airtime. We don't have a how do I have peaceful pill, right? We don't have how do I have a be hopeful um, remedy, right? Natural herbs, you know, we don't have any of that stuff. We spend a lot of time down here. This fuels an economy. This is very silent, but it's always present. Hope that makes sense. And getting from here to here is effortless. It's crazy. It's when I learned this, I kind of was angry because I kind of prided myself on my education. And I thought the more I analyze things, the more I delve into things, the better I was going to be as a therapist and the better I could help my clients. But my clients never got better and I was miserable and burnout because it didn't provide me any kind of relief long term. 